Our scripture reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the verses 14 through 21, and you find it inside your worship folder. 2 Corinthians 5, the verses 14 through 21. This is God's word. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's God's word. And last week, as we studied Joshua chapter 7, we saw how one man's sin could have a tremendous impact on the whole nation. When Akan looted some of the valuables from Jericho, it wasn't just he that experienced the consequences of his sin. No, 36 people died in the next battle the Israelites tried to fight, and the whole nation was filled with fear. God considered the whole nation to be guilty because of what one man did. Well, today we see how this sort of group accountability can be good news. For as Paul says in verse 19, God has blessed all of us sinners because of the work of one man, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Instead of counting our sins against us, God has reconciled us to himself. And that's good news. It's good news for all those who are honest about our need for such reconciliation. For all who are willing to confess that we're a lot like a con. For all who are willing to admit that we're nothing more than rebels against God's righteous rule. That we deserve the death penalty, just like any other traitor. In fact, one of the things we do when we take the Lord's Supper is to remember that when Christ died on the cross... He received nothing more and nothing less than what we all deserve. And that's what Paul says in the last verse of this passage. On the cross, the spotless Lamb of God, the one who never sinned, became sin for us. He took the sins of all his people upon himself so that we might become righteous, so that we might be pure and holy, so that we might be able to stand before the judgment seat of Christ without fear. That's the flip side of group accountability, the joyous truth we celebrate at this table today. If God considered all the people of Israel guilty because of a con sin, all of Christ's people receive the benefit of his death and are considered holy and righteous because of what he did. But we also celebrate a more mysterious truth today. For as we take this bread and this wine into ourselves, we are acknowledging that by faith we are united to Christ, that we become part of his own body, just as this bread and this wine become part of ours. Those who trust in Christ are truly one with him, and he is one with us. In verse 14, Paul thus draws the logical conclusion from this fact. If Christ died for all his people, then there is a very real sense in which all his people have already died. Died with him. Died in him. So when we proclaim the Lord's death through this meal, we proclaim our own death as well. 
And why is that something to celebrate? Well, we see the reason in verse 15. Christ didn't die for us so that we could go on living for ourselves. Living as if we were still in bondage to sin. Because the work of Christ has freed us from sin. And how do we know that? Because he didn't just die. He rose again on our behalf. And that's another amazing truth to which this supper points. If we are in Christ, if we are connected to him, if we are part of his body, we have died with him to the power of sin and we have died with him to the power of death and we have risen with him to newness of life. That's why Paul says in verse 17 that if anyone is in Christ, there's a whole new creation. The old things have passed away and in their place, New things have come. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're celebrating this great truth that we have not only been forgiven by the blood of Christ, we have been cleansed of sin. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. This, then, is the word of reconciliation, the word that God speaks to us in the Lord's Supper, in the Scriptures, through Christ. God says, I know you're a sinner. <coughs> I know the depth of your sin even greater than you do, but I have provided a sacrifice for all who would trust in Christ. That's the word of reconciliation. God says, turn from your sins. Turn to me. Why go on in rebellion? Because of what Jesus has done, I don't hold any of those things against you anymore. Be reconciled to me. That's the word of reconciliation. That's good news, and that's God's invitation to his table. But as we leave this table, Paul reminds us that we are to carry this word of reconciliation with us in word and in deed. We're to demonstrate our forgiveness. We're to demonstrate our newness of life in part by being reconciled to one another. In this way, Paul says in verse 20, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Well, what does that look like? Well, for starters, as verse 16 says, it means not pulling ourselves back from others, you know, those whom we consider different or strange. We're not to look at them, as Paul says, according to the flesh, that is, according to a human perspective. We're to look at people through God's eyes. Seeing all human beings at one time as priceless image bearers of God, but also as sinners just as much in need of a Savior as we are. And yes, that's another one of the truths to which the Lord's Supper points. For this table is not just members for members of any one congregation. It's not just members for members of any one denomination. No, everyone who has been baptized and made a public profession of faith in Christ in any Christian church is welcome at this table. For as all believers gather around this one table, especially on this World Communion Sunday, as we all gather around the table of the Lord, we celebrate the fact that all those walls that we think are so important, all those ways that have divided humanity, all those things have been broken down in Christ. As Paul says in another place, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Reconciled to God. Reconciled to one another. So no, this table is not for those who think they're perfect. It's not for those who think they don't need Christ's cross and empty tomb. This table is not for those who reject their need to be reconciled to God or their need to be reconciled to the family of faith. This table is not about individualistic do-it-yourself salvation. Now, this table is for those who know they're sinners. It's for those who know they're helpless. This table is for those who know they need to be forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ from the inside out. This table is for those who acknowledge their connection not only to Christ by faith, but connection to all the others who share that faith all over the world. So come to the table. 
Feed on Christ in your hearts by faith and be thankful for the reconciliation God has accomplished in him. And then live for him who has died and who rose again for you. Tell the story of his grace. Show his love so that others may also find salvation in him. Come to the table and be reconciled to God. And then go be an ambassador for Christ that the world might also be reconciled to God.